Hey, so we are back here and we have Randall Dex all the way from California. So Randall, from Lithuania, with love to California, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Super excited to hang out. Um, even if it is just over the, the internet, like this is awesome. So thanks. <laughs> very good. Very good. I know that it's a very, very early morning in California. So I hope that you have a lot of energy. Uh, if not, I'm sending you lots of energy. And um, um, I myself, I am ready to retire as early as possible. And I hope that in your this presentation, which is going to take 45 minutes, uh, I'm going to hear the tips uh, how to retire as early as possible. Will I hear that? I certainly hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. All right, cool. Well, what's up, everyone? Hello from San Francisco uh, Bay Area, where I'm at this morning at my house. It's super early. It's dark outside. I don't know if you can tell from the windows behind me, but um, thanks for having me. Um, by the way, I just want to mention as we get into this, this is the very first like non-technical talk I've ever given in my whole life. <laughs> so just a disclaimer, um, might be a little rough, but hopefully this is something fun that teaches you a little bit about personal finance. And afterwards, by the way, because I'm probably going to use the entire 45 minutes, once the talk's over or as the talk's going, feel free to drop a bunch of questions in the chat. I will go through and answer as many as I can afterwards. And uh, you can always connect with me after as well. So with that said, let's get right into it. Um, a little bit about my background. So I'm Randall. Super nice to meet you. I'm the head of developer advocacy at a company called Okta. We're like a, a web security company that makes authentication and authorization simpler. Um, my background is I do a lot of Python, JavaScript, and Golang development. Um, I've been doing open source work for about 20 years, so I build and maintain um, quite a few open source developer tools. Um, I'm an author, so I've published a couple books, and I'm also a builder. I run several API services that are quite popular for developers, and I run lots of different like command line tooling and have some, some consumer projects and stuff like that that I work on in my free time, and I just generally love programming things, and so it's it's been like a passion of my life and uh, a while back so maybe about 12 years ago now I also got really into personal finance and it's just something that I sort of geeked out on for a while and I'm one of those people where when I get into something I just love to read books about it watch YouTube videos about it you know read forums listen to podcasts and it's something that just sort of stuck with me and so for the last I want to say maybe 10 11 12 years something like that it's just been a, a continued hobby of mine and so uh, before we start talking about the main thing today, I just wanted to share my personal story. Um, I've never really talked about this with other people, by the way, <laughs> but I just wanted to sort of set the stage for what I'm going to be sharing with you. So this is me. Um, you know, obviously, I look a lot worse than Dexter from Dexter's Lab does, but this is sort of me uh, when I got started programming um, when I was really young. And when I got out of high school, I went to the University of California in the state where I live, and I started working on a computer science degree. And when I was working on my computer science degree, while I did really well in my computer science classes, I was basically terrible at like literally everything else. You know, I had to take general ed classes and history and art and things like that. And I just honestly hated it. And I did not force myself to do the work. And so as a result of that, I dropped out of school on my second year or after my second year of school was done. And so when this happened, it was a terrible part of my life. I was like super depressed. I had to move back home with my parents. And I basically had around $75,000 or so of student loan debt, which is just a ton of money <laughs> coming out of school. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life and how I was going to turn things around. And what I did is I started just, I figured, okay, first thing I need to do is like pay down some of this damn debt. Cause like I basically have these crazy monthly payments. I had to pay something like $3,000 a month, like minimum just to keep things current. And it stressed me out like crazy. And so what I did was I applied to a bunch of jobs. Luckily, the very first job I applied to gave me an offer, which was amazing. I accepted it like right away. And so I started working full time in the tech industry. Now, I wasn't making a ton of money or anything, but I was living at home with my parents and I saved everything I had and used it to pay down my debt. And so around a year later, when I left this job, I by that point in time, I paid off around $30,000 of my debt. And so my total net worth was around negative $45,000. <laughs> and 
when I left this company, I went to work with a couple of people that I met, a couple friends, and they had a product that was already out, that was already successful. And I started building and maintaining the product. And over the next five years or so, I helped launch new business lines there. We did a bunch of brand new things and it was crazy fun. And I ended up getting paid a lot more than I was making at my first job. And around this time, I also got married. Um, my wife was working full time as well. And so we basically just tried to live like relatively frugally. We didn't really think about it too much. And we just tried to pay down our debt and save as much money as possible. So after doing that for a number of years, I ended up working with another group of friends at another tech company startup. That went pretty well. And uh, basically four years ago, our company got acquired by the company I work at today, which is called Okta. And so for the last you know, four years, I've just been working at Okta, running developer advocacy, building all sorts of cool web security tools and things like that. So it's been, it's been really fun. But the reason I'm bringing this story up is because it wasn't really until this part of my life, after my first job, that I really started thinking about what I want to do with my finances. Like it wasn't until then that I thought about, should I even be saving money? Um, like how much should I save? Like, am I going to have any money in the future? It didn't really register to me. Before this point in my life, I was basically just sort of going through the motions. If I had money, I might just spend it on whatever. I didn't really think things through. So today, um, it's been quite a long journey. So I've been working in the industry professionally for 12 years now. And uh, about two years ago, my wife and I hit what I would call financial independence, which basically means we have enough money invested that we no longer need to work. And so when we hit that point, we both realized, oh, shit, we could retire right now if we wanted to. We can keep working. We can change jobs. We can do all these different things. And it was this like incredibly freeing feeling. <laughs> and it took us about 10 years from the moment we started until we hit enough money that we were we knew we'd be able to retire safely. And so the way this works, the, the way financial independence works, at least in the US, and by the way, as, we're, as I'm giving this talk today, I'm gonna talk about like the concepts for financial independence, but the reality is that like, depending on the country you're in and the locale, there's different rules and taxes and different things you can do to optimize. I'm very familiar with them in particular in the US, in California, so I'm gonna be like leaving a lot of those US specific things out. Um, but in general, I think the rules are very similar across different countries. But anyways, the high level of it is that the way financial independence works is basically there's this thing called the 4% rule. It was a study that was done where a bunch of researchers analyzed the performance of the stock market over a very long period of time and said, hey, if you just have all of your money invested in the stock market over a long period of time, how much of that money can you live off of every year without ever running out of money? And it turns out the answer is 4%, <laughs> okay? So what that means is that if you have $100,000 invested in the stock market, then on average, you'll be able to withdraw 4,000 of those dollars per year to spend and live off of. And that's inflation adjusted by, uh, adjusted by the way. So over time, that 4,000 will increase a little bit as money becomes less valuable. But the idea is that if you invest $100,000, then every year you can spend $4,000 without ever running out of money, which is pretty cool. That also means if you have a million dollars invested, you can spend $40,000 a year without ever running out of money, which is pretty cool, right? Same thing, $2.5 million means you have $100,000 a year to spend. And the quick math you can use to figure this out is basically this. The amount of money you need to retire early or be financially independent, the freedom number, as I would like to call it, is however much money you spend every year times 25. So it's really a simple formula. And this will basically let you back your way into this 4% calculation. So here's some more quick math you can look at if you just want to get inspired. Um, if you know that you need to spend $75,000 a year, then congratulations. That means you need to save up $1,875,000 worth of investments to be financially independent, to go retire and you know be on the beach somewhere, whatever you want to do, right? And so very simple formula. So with that being said, my plan for today is to really talk you through how to get here. Um, I'm gonna share what I've learned um, from my journey and then also what I've learned from lots of the other people that have helped me figure this stuff out. So this is a combination of sources. Um, at the end of this talk, I have a bunch of links to resources that I found really useful when I was learning this stuff. Hopefully it'll be useful to you as well. And yeah, we'll just sort of have some fun with it. But before I do that, there's one thing I want to mention. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge some stuff 
that is slightly uncomfortable. So the first thing is that, look, I realize talking about finance in the middle of a global pandemic is somewhat insensitive. Um, and here's the thing, right? Like all of us, all of you watching this are incredibly privileged. You know, like we're online watching a cool conference with a bunch of extremely brilliant technical minds all around the world. And we're just lucky, right? As engineers, all of us earn far more money than like average employees throughout the world. Our profession's in really high demand and generally our profession is one of the, the better pandemic proof ones. And so I just want to acknowledge that like we're all in an extremely fortunate position to even be thinking about this stuff. And so I just didn't want to let that go to waste. But with that said, let's continue on. So I've laid this out in terms of five core steps that you can take to really get you to like be, being financially independent. Um, the first step is to understand where you're at today. And this is critical, no matter what your goal is, whether it's finance stuff, health stuff, relationship stuff, no matter what it is, right? Like you have to understand where you're at today if you're going to change where you're at in the future. And in particular, there's four things that are really, really good to track if you're not tracking them already, okay? The first thing is your burn rate. Like how much money are you spending every single month? You can also call us like your budget, you know, your, your spending, whatever it is, just track this. The second thing is debt. How much money do you owe to other people? Also, you need to track your assets. So how much, how many positive value things do you have? Do you own a house? Is that house worth hundred thousand dollars? Well, that's an asset. Do you own a car that's worth $10,000? That's also an asset. Do you have a hundred thousand dollars of investments in the bank? That's also an asset, right? And then finally, your net worth is really valuable to track, especially in the long run, because it helps you see like this long trend line. But basically your net worth, what you do is you take all your assets and you subtract all your debts. And that gives you a number which says, here's how much you're worth. And the idea is that over time, you want to see that number go up and to the right, at least hopefully, right? You don't want to see it go down and to the right. That would be bad. You want it to go up over time. Now, out of all these things you're tracking, the most important by far is how much money you spend, your budget, basically. And the reason this is so important is because if you look at these other things here, if you look at your net worth, your debt, your assets, all of these things are not really that easy to control, right? Like if you've already got $100,000 of student loan debt, you can't really control that too much. Now, yeah, you could take out more debt and just do make terrible choices, obviously, <laughs> but you don't want to do that. But what I'm saying is it's not that easy to improve all these things, except for your, your spending. You can directly control your spending. And so it's one of the most important things you need to be on top of. Now, in the U.S., there's a couple automated tracking tools I use, which I'm absolutely in love with. Um, I use a tool called Mint.com, which is great for budgeting. This is actually an example, a screenshot, a part of my budget from a couple months ago. Um, you can see that, for example, my wife and I spent $937 this month on food, like groceries and restaurants. Uh, we spent $33 shopping on Amazon. <laughs> now, this, this was a particularly low month. It wasn't exactly the best representation, but you get the idea. Mints will do things like connect to your bank account and credit cards and pull in all the spending that you make and let you categorize it. It's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I like using is personal capital. Um, in the U.S., personal capital lets you track your investments and basically lets you see how is your money allocated. Um, there's a couple like issues with the software, but generally it's pretty helpful. I'm sure these things exist for those of you that live outside the U.S. as well. It's just a matter of sort of finding a tracking tool that you like and sticking with it. All right, so that's the first thing. Step two is making a budget and sticking to it. And as my mom would sort of say, you just have to make sure you know where your money is going. This is really important, right? And the way you should run a monthly budget, because I've talked to tons of people about this and I realize almost no one has any idea how to do it. Uh, the, the ideal way, in my opinion, to run a monthly budget is like this. First of all, you want to track all of your spending by category. You don't just want to say, I'm going to spend $5,000 this month. What you want to say is, I'm going to spend $100 on you know, my phone. I'm going to spend $200 on utilities. Whatever it is, you want to be specific. That will make you it far easier for you to hold yourself accountable. Secondly, you want to assign realistic budgets for each category. So a common mistake people make, including me, I screwed this up. It took me six months before I got it right. A common mistake people make is they work on a budget and when they start doing it, they're like, I'm going to save so much money. I'm only going to spend $200 this month on food and it's not going to work. So just be realistic or as realistic as possible. Uh, number three, 
you want to make sure that you're tracking this damn thing like all the time. At least once a week, you should be like looking at your budget, how much you spent, how much you have left. If you don't look at it, it's literally useless because it will not have enough, you know, space in your mind to like be impactful. And the fourth thing is if you have a partner, a spouse, a husband, a wife, whatever, whatever situation you're in, you want to discuss and plan a budget with your partner every single month. Um, budgeting isn't something you just do like once and then forget about. It's something you need to do literally every month. And so what I do is once a month I talk with my wife and we figure out wh what do we want to spend money on next month? Like, it's fine if we change the budget, you know, like if we decide we want to go on a vacation and spend $2,000, that's fine. We just put it in the budget. That's the important part. And the other thing I would just say is when you break your, your budget up into categories, use real categories, like use things that make sense. So if you have a lot of debt, have a category for debt. So you know how much you're spending on that. If you have transportation costs, put that in there. If you're giving gifts to people, put gifts in there really go in depth and make it something that is going to be useful to you. Now, warning, this is something that should be pretty obvious, but I've noticed a lot of people that like literally do not do this. But when you're planning your budget for the following month, if you notice that your expenses are going to be more than the money you make from your work or your investments or whatever it is, then you need to cut your expenses. Now, that sounds like sort of obvious, right? Like don't spend more money than you make. But trust me, I know tons of people that make fantastic amounts of money that like do not do this. And it's a core concept in eventually getting to a point where you could retire early or just like work on things you like. So make sure you always, always stick to this rule. Now, why is it so important to budget? The main reason it's so important to budget is because you don't want to be like this guy. Now, I've been working in the tech industry in California for 12 years now professionally, and I've met a lot of just absolutely amazing rock star programmers that are like world famous people. And one of the things I've noticed is that even though you can be this like brilliant person and be a great engineer and be like incredibly smart, um, it doesn't exempt you from looking back over the last couple of years of your life and realizing that, you know, maybe you've been pouring your heart and soul into your work and you've been doing all this great stuff and you've been killing it, but you don't really have anything to show for it at the end of the day. And so it's really easy, no matter how much money you make, to just not think about it and just sort of like blow money here and there and just really wake up a couple of years later and realize, damn, I put in all this work for years and I just don't really have that much to show for it. And so budgeting is the thing that will prevent this from being you. So make sure you do that. All right, the third step is you really wanna pay off all of your debts as soon as possible. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, part of it's also like a theoretical exercise but I'll sort of walk you through uh, some of the reasoning. Now, before we go into the reasoning side, there's two types of debt you should know about. Uh, the first type of debt is what we call consumer debt. And consumer debt are the credit cards that you have, payment plans, so if you purchase an iPhone but you don't pay the full price, you just pay like $20 a month or whatever, that is a form of debt, you're on a payment plan. Um, car loans, personal loans, anything like that. These are all things that you purchased that are consumption related. Um, on the other hand, you have non-consumer debts. And these are things that, while they can sort of be argued are consumption, um, a lot of the times they're not. So for example, medical debt in the US, that's something that's a very real concern people have. Um, home loans, so if you purchase a home and you don't have the money to just buy it outright, obviously you're gonna be taking on some, some housing expenses there. Uh, student loans, these are all things that are very, very common, but generally considered to be not consumer focused debt. Now, these two types of debt are different. So consumer debt, for example, is without question worse than non-consumer debt. Consumer debt is always going to have a higher interest rate. So it's going to cost you more money to have consumer debt. Um, non-consumer debt can sometimes be potentially a good thing. Like if you purchase a house on a loan, um, there's a lot of ways that like that could potentially be a good investment. And so you don't have to necessarily pay off like your house loan, but it is something that I would personally recommend. Now, when you're going through paying off debt, if you have debt, there's a couple different ways you can go about it. Um, the first way is, a, is a, a pattern called the snowball method. And this is basically where you decide to pay off your smallest debt first, and then your next smallest debt, and then your next smallest debt until eventually you get to the largest debt. And what you do is you basically just throw whatever extra money you have left at the end of every month, into this debt to get rid of it quickly. 
Um, if you take a look at a real world example of this, here's, here's a pretty uh, good approximation. So let's say, as an example, that you, you have $52,000 total worth of debt. You have a $1,000 credit card, a $4,000 credit card, a $7,000 personal loan, some student loans, and here's how much you pay every month, and here's the interest rates on the loans. Now, I've organized these from smallest to largest, but I've organized them so the consumer debt is first. Because again, consumer debt should always take precedence if you're gonna pay things off over non-consumer debt. Now, imagine that you know, you're working, you're, you're paying for all of your living expenses, and after all of your expenses, you only have $75 a month left at the end of every you know, month. Well, what I would do if I was doing a debt snowball to pay this stuff down is, I would start putting my extra $75 a month into this, this smallest debt first, this $1,000 credit card bill. And once this is paid off, now I'm going to have $75 a month left over every month plus the $94 a month that I was previously spending on this, this credit card payment. And so my total extra income at the end of every month would be $169. Then I would just do it again for this loan. And when this one's paid off, my income that's left over at the end of every paycheck is going to jump up by $380 and so forth and so on until eventually I, when I paid all these things off, I have an extra $1,329 left at the end of the month. And as you can see, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't really think about how much debt they have, but if you add up all the payments and you sort of look through it, it can be astounding how much money you actually earn by like just not having to pay other people. So I highly recommend you track your debt, you try to get rid of it as fast as possible um, because it opens up a lot of other options once you hit this point. Now, the next option you have is to pay down your debts by the most efficient way possible, which is really like targeting the highest interest loans first. And this works the exact same way as the debt snowball method, except instead of organizing from smallest to largest, you're organizing from largest interest to smallest interest. So for example, if you have two loans, a $35,000 car loan that's charging you 12% interest or a $5,000 personal loan that's charging you 7% interest, you would pay down the 12% interest loan first. And if you think about this, it's the most efficient way to do it because let's say you have $100 extra that you want to pay down on one of these loans at the end of the month. If you put $100 into the personal loan at 7% interest, then you're basically saving yourself seven cents on the dollar in the future, right? Because that's how much interest they're charging you. If you put it into the $35,000 loan, then you're saving yourself 12 cents on the dollar. So you have a net positive gain of five cents because that's per dollar, because that's the difference between these two loan percentages. And so this is the most efficient way mathematically to pay off debt. Now, which of these two methods should you decide to follow? Well, if you're like me and you want a lot of flexibility and options and you're sort of risk averse, I would go for the debt snowball method because it gives you a lot more momentum. It feels good to have extra money in your budget at the end of the month as you pay stuff off quickly. But if you just want to maximize how much money you have and how much money you're making, then go for the interest-based loan repayment. Um, it's definitely the, the more effective way to do it if you really care about the dollars and cents. And why is it important to pay off debt? So this is just my personal opinion, but a lot of people have no problem hanging on to debt. Um, I'm not really one of them. I am a huge, huge proponent of getting rid of whatever debt you have. And the reason why is because it gives you a ton of flexibility and options. And the main reason is it just reduces stress. Um, I still remember very clearly what it felt like when I dropped out of college and had this huge amount of student loans. And, you know, having to pay thousands of dollars a month when you are literally broken, have nothing. Um, I just viscerally remember that feeling and it was so stressful and so, you know, just gave me so much anxiety that as I paid things off, it like dramatically improved my life and my mindset and my health and everything. I just felt better. Like you feel unburdened, not having to worry about paying other people for living, you know? All right. So the next step, step four, step four is all about saving your money. Now I know you all hopefully know this is going to be in here. Um, but yeah, it's just really about saving money. Uh, it's something parents will tell you all the time, right? Like, don't forget to save your money. So the question is, how much money should you save? And the answer, in my opinion, is you should have six months of your living expenses saved up. This is pretty general advice from like most financial advisors will tell you something similar. 
Um, but basically it's having an emergency fund that's around six months worth of living expenses. Now, this money should be used for things like emergency car repairs, if you have a leaky roof on your house, a family emergency, a job loss, and having six months worth of living expenses in savings is like, honestly, one of the best investments you can make. It just reduces your stress almost to nothing. And I'm telling you this from personal experience. Once you have a comfortable buffer there, it means that if you lose your job, you, you just don't care because you can live for six months, you can literally not earn a cent, and, you're be, and you'll be completely fine. You can just find a new job. Um, it means you can, if you have a major problem, like a health issue, or your, your car stops working, it doesn't cause you any stress because you have this money sitting in an account that you can use to cover these expenses. And so it's just a really, really nice way to like live, and it will make you feel far better. And I think that you know, in the middle of a global pandemic that we are now in, it really highlights the need for having something like this. I mean, how many people have were seriously impacted by COVID and lost their jobs, lost their source of income for a while? So having at least six months of uh, living expenses saved up is just very freeing. Um, here's a real a real world example, by the way. I'm going to use this later in the talk as well. But what I'm doing here is I'm going to show you how to sort of budget and stuff and how to and how like to save an emergency fund from the perspective of a brand new junior developer who just graduated university who lives in California who got their first programming job. So if you live in California and you got a programming job, it's very common for new developers to make around $100,000 in salary. Okay. Now, if you live in California, that means you're going to be taxed approximately 30% of that money which means that after all of your expenses, your paycheck every month will be around $5,900 a month, which is you know, very good. <laughs> um, I also projected that a junior developer living in California can probably fairly easily live on $2,700 a month, which means they would have $3,200 a month left over to save. Now, let me walk you through this mock budget that I put together. I basically said that out of this $2,700 a month, a person might spend $100 a month on entertainment, you know, movies, Netflix, whatever, $1,450 a month on rent, $750 a month on food, $50 a month on transportation, $50 a month on personal care, $200 a month for utilities, and $100 a month for gifts. Now, this is a, a realistic but not extravagant budget. So this is absolutely doable for a programmer that lives in California that isn't, you know, isn't anything special, basically. Now, in this case, this person should have a six-month emergency fund. And what that means is you take the amount of money they spend every month, so $2,700, you multiply it by six, and that gives you $16,200 to work with. All right, That should be how much you save up. Um, at this rate, if you're only spending $2,700 a month and you're saving $3,200 a month, that means it can take you a little more than five months to save up an emergency fund. And so that's pretty damn crazy, right? Like that's that's not bad. It will only take you six months, let's say, to save up a six month emergency fund. That's absolutely fantastic. But the only reason you're able to do that, again, is because you're making a, a good salary. You're making a decent amount of money here. And so it's easier to save a higher percentage of it. Now, when you do this, uh, where should you keep your money? The answer is just a normal savings account at your bank. Um, you know, that's what I do. Um, I'm not sure how it works overseas, but in the U S at least the money you put in a savings account is backed by the federal government. So even if your bank goes out of business, like there's no risk that you're going to run out of money or anything like that. Um, all your money is safe and protected. All right. So step five, investing your money. This is the final step in becoming financially independent that you have to understand. Um, now the reason investing is so important is because there's only two things that you can invest in. And by the way, I see the chat talking about how this example is unrealistic. I will happily talk about that afterwards, but this is a very realistic budget that I've personally lived on. <laughs> I actually spend less than this today, so I'm more than happy to talk about that later if you want. But uh, as going back to the investing part, one of the reasons investing is so important is because there's only a couple things you can do with your money. The first thing is you can save it, right? Now, saving is fantastic because you can't lose the money that you save and put in a savings account, right? It's just going to sit there. But the downside to saving is that interest rates are low, which means banks aren't going to pay you basically anything um, for keeping your money with them. So you're not going to earn any money. The second thing is that if you think about it, the money you put into savings is really 
losing value because inflation goes up every year. In the US, the inflation rate is approximately 2 to 3% every year. But on a savings account, like my savings account today pays me 0.6% interest. So if inflation goes up 2% this year and my bank pays me 0.6% interest on my money, there's a 1.4% value of the money I've saved that has been lost. So I'm actually losing more money than I'm saving. Does that make sense? So saving isn't a good long-term strategy. It's literally only used as some uh, form of insurance, like an emergency fund, basically. So your other choice is to invest, and this is what you have to do. Now, investing is going to earn you, on average, much higher returns than saving in the long run. You know, uh, in the U.S., the historical 90-year average of the stock market is around 9.8% before you factor in inflation. That is way more than the 0.6% you can earn on a bank account. Um, this higher return is going to protect your money from being eaten away by inflation. And the, the final thing is that investing is also just really risky. Okay. So unlike a savings account where you put your money in there, it's totally safe and secure. When you're investing money in buying companies like publicly traded companies, it's a risky proposition. Your money might go down. It might go up. It's very volatile, but in the long run, it tends to perform really well. So let's take a look at the same junior developer who's making hundred thousand dollars in California, who's living off $2,700 a month. This person's retirement goal from the day they start working would basically be $810,000. Now, the way I figured that out was I took their amount of money they spend every month. I multiplied it by 12 to get their annual expenditure. Then I multiplied that by 25. And so this backs us into that 4% rule that we saw earlier. Now, how long do you think it would take for this junior developer to save up enough money and invest enough money to retire based on these stats? So they're earning $100,000, they're saving $3,200 a month and investing it, and they basically need to hit $810,000 minimum to be, able to, to be able to retire early, be financially independent, whatever you wanna call it. Well, if you do the math on this, it will take this person approximately 12 years of working, assuming they get no raises and their budget stays exactly the same as we just talked about. And this is based on, again, the historical returns from the US stock market. But that's crazy, right? Like if you get out of high school at age 18, you get a four-year university degree, so you're 22, and you work for 12 years, so you're 34 years old, you could have enough money to retire by the time you're 34 years old, which is pretty insane. Um, and that's something that is a really lucky uh, thing that just a lot of engineers can literally do this, you know? Um, of course, you're going to get raises, you're going to move up, you're going to earn more money in your career, stuff like that. So it makes this all the more possible. Now, if you don't want to invest, let's just say you just want to save your money. I've talked to some people where they're like, I hate investing. I'm super against it. I just want to save and pile up my money. How long would it take you to hit that $810,000 goal? It would actually take you 20 years. So it would take you eight additional years of your life to be able to save up to hit this $800,000-ish amount. Now, the other problem, of course, is that whole 4% rule for financial independence we talked about earlier is based on you having your money invested, like invested, not in a savings account. And the reason why is because investment returns are much higher than the interest you earn on a savings account. And so if you are you know, just saving money, you're never really going to be able to retire unless you have way, 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 way more than 25 times your annual expenses. All right. So now let's talk, uh, quickly talk about how the stock market works. So the stock market is just a bunch of companies that you can buy a portion of. And stocks are sold through an exchange. In the US, we have a few different exchanges. One of them is called the New York Stock Exchange. London, they have the London Stock Exchange. It's very different. Um, if you, as, a, as an individual, want to buy stock, the way you do it is you sign up with a brokerage account. In the US, we have ones like Vanguard, E-Trade, Fidelity. They're all totally fine. Um, I actually use Vanguard personally. And you can basically give money to Vanguard and say, Vanguard, I would like to buy some stock, please. And they will talk to the New York Stock Exchange and make that happen. Now, here's the thing, though. If you're investing by just buying lots of shares to Google or Facebook or Amazon or whatever, it's extremely risky, right? Because what happens if Google goes bankrupt or Amazon, you know, you know, uh, I don't know, Alibaba decides to just destroy Amazon in the U.S. or something, right? Like, there's a million things that can go wrong with a single company, so it's really risky, and it's not what you want to do. So the way you should generally invest your money is in this thing called index funds. 
And index funds are basically a way to purchase a, a lot of companies all at once so that you reduce your risk. Um, Vanguard, for example, has index funds that look like this. Um, they have tons of them, by the way, but these are some of the ones that are like very, very popular and well-known. So the first one's called VTWX. And basically what this is, if you purchase a share, if you purchase money into this index fund, you're basically buying a little sliver of every company around the world. And what that means is that if the entire world economy does well, you're, you will do well. You, the value of the money you invested will go up. And over time, that's historically what has happened. So like technology gets better, people become more wealthy, like third world countries start to develop more infrastructure and become, you know, in a better place. And so generally things get better in the long run. Um, if you were to put, uh, you can also purchase like just parts of US companies, which is a, is a very po popular fund called VTSAX for that. So you're basically investing in the US economy. You can purchase just shares of non-US companies, so international companies. Um, for me personally, like my wife and I have 70% of our money invested in the U.S. stock market and 30% invested in the international markets. And so we're basically betting 70% of our money that the U.S. economy is going to do well and 30% that the rest of the world is going to do well. And this is a very common way to sort of break up your investments. If you want to keep it really simple, you can literally just buy a single world index fund like this one at the top here and just be done with it and never think about it again. So it really could be that easy. So just to recap, here is the step-by-step -step plan you need to basically be able to retire early, hit financial independence, have control of your finances. Track your spending and net worth. Build and stick to a budget every single month. Pay off your debts, save a six-month emergency fund, and invest all of the extra money you have into broadly diversified index funds. If you do this consistently over a long period of time, you're absolutely going to hit financial independence. It really is that simple. So now, we only have a few minutes left, I know. I'm going to just run you through some really fun stuff to talk about and think about, okay? Um, these are also like a little bit of tips from me. So the first thing I'm going to say is that your savings rate is really, really important, all right? So it turns out that it doesn't necessarily matter how much you make. Like, yeah, as an engineer, you're going to be making a lot of money, um, just generally speaking, of course. And that means you can save more of it if you live a reasonable lifestyle. But it turns out that this is a pretty easy formula to calculate. So if you save 20% of your money, then it would take you 37 years to have enough investments to retire. If you save 50% of your money, half of whatever you make, it'll take you 17 years to be able to retire. Now, let's just say that from the day, the first day you become an engineer, you're very smart with money and you save half of everything and you start working at age 22. That means that by age 39, you'd have enough money to retire on, which is still an incredibly early retirement and gives you a ton of freedom for your entire life. It's absolutely insane. But the really crazy thing is what happens if you save more than half of your money? Like what happens if you save 75% of every dollar that you make? Um, you could literally retire in seven years, which is absolutely bananas. My wife and I were somewhere between 60 and 75%. It took us about 10 years to hit this mark, um, just as a reference point. Um, but again, we lived relatively frugal lives. We started learning about this stuff fairly early on, and we tried to just be um, very reasonable with the things that we did. So here's some real world, world examples of this. If you make $70,000 a year and you live on half, It'll take you 17 years to retire. If you make $120,000 a year and you live on 48, it'll take you 12 and a half years to retire. If you make $200,000 a year and live on $50,000, it will only take you seven years to you know, retire. And the important thing here that I would encourage you to think about is it doesn't matter how much you're making today. Think about the future. So if you literally live paycheck to paycheck today, that might be okay. Maybe you focus on paying down your debts and that frees up some extra money to invest. Maybe when you get raises in the future or switch jobs and like become more senior in your career, you don't increase your lifestyle expenses a lot and you just invest the extra money there. There's lots of ways, even if you're late in the game, to make up for this and to like catch up. So do not stress about these things. I'm just saying that these are supposed to be motivational. Like seeing the numbers, at least for me, was very inspiring early on. So the other thing I recommend is 
you know, you sort of treat this like a game a little bit. I love video games. I don't know about you all, but I find them really fun. Um, one of the games I sort of played is I built a spreadsheet and I sort of listed off all the things I spend money on every single month. So I have like a phone bill that's $100 a month. We spend around $100 a month on entertainment, $500 a month on groceries. I listed all these things out. Then what I did is I calculated how much money I would need invested to pay for this particular bill like every single month. So for example, to cover my phone bill of $100 a month in automatically in the future, I would need to invest $30,000. And that's because if I multiply what this works out to, it's $1,200 a year for my phone. And if I multiply that by 25, it's $30,000. So I knew when I hit my first $30,000 of money invested that guess what? My phone bill is paid from now into the future forever. And it was pretty cool. And I just went through the list and I wrote everything down and I saved up and I had goals for each of these items. And as I saved up enough money and invested enough money to cover each of these bills, I crossed them off the list and I said, look, look at how close we're getting to being financially independent. And it was just really motivating and sort of fun. Um, the next tip I have, or the last tip I have, I think is to automate everything. Now I'm a developer and I legitimately spend, I don't know, at least 20% of my time thinking about ways to automate my work. Um, I highly recommend you do the same thing with your personal finances. So if you have debt, you're paying down, automate that shit, <laughs> you know, like set it up so that whatever extra money you have left over in your budget every month gets automatically put into your payments. Um, set up automatic savings have a certain percent of the money when you're saving up that emergency fund that gets transferred from your checking account into your savings account automatically. Budgeting, automate that. Use a tool like mint.com or whatever you have available in your, in your country to make this easier on you so you're not like looking through credit card statements and bank statements all this time. And then also investing. So automate your investing just like you would do with savings. Set it all up so it's, it's super easy to handle. And this is something literally anyone can do. It just takes some focus and some dedication, but like you can absolutely do this. So don't feel like this is something that's out of reach. And also I would say that we talked about some of the extremes in here, you know, like, yeah, it is possible to retire in 10 years if you're extremely frugal, but this isn't a, a, a rush, right? Like you don't have to have enough become financially independent in 10 years or five years or whatever crazy stuff other people are doing. You can take your time. You know, if you just save, 20% of your money, you're still going to retire early. You're going to be retired at 59 instead of 65. If you save a little bit more than that, you're going to retire years earlier. And so there's basically what I'm saying is there's never a problem with saving more and investing more. It's only going to help you and give you more options. So what did I skip in this presentation? Well, because this is a 45 minute presentation, I had to skip some stuff. So first of all, I skipped a lot of the very specific things you should do to minimize taxes in the US because this is not a primarily US audience. I also skipped talking about alternative investments, which are things like purchasing real estate, handling purchasing bonds, cryptocurrencies, all that stuff. Um, and the reason why is because the 4% rule, which basically everyone uses, is based on investing in broadly diversified index funds. It's not based on these other things. And so I'm more than happy to talk about that separately. I actually do own some real estate stuff. Uh, we could get into that, but it just didn't really fit in the context of the talk. We also didn't discuss the in-depth uh, debate around like whether you should pay down your debt or invest um, or taxes and tax planning. And again, some of these things are personal decisions people have to make and some are country specific things. And so it just wouldn't really be appropriate. But the final thing I want to talk about before we go is why. Why should you do literally any of these things? And I'm going to give you my personal opinion on this. Um, a lot of people think that doing this is a way to just live on the beach and like be happy. And um, other people think it's a way to just be able to buy more things and the latest technology all the time and just sort of, you know, have a more glamorous lifestyle, let's say. But I think there's two things that are a lot more important than this. The first thing is that if you are wise with your money, it means you can help more people. Like you can dramatically impact more people's lives. Maybe it means you can help a family member who's struggling. Maybe it means you can donate money to a cause you really believe in. Maybe it means you can like literally just give extra tips to waiters and waitresses when you see them at a restaurant to help other people out. But it gives you the possibility to be really generous. And that's something that I think is invaluable. Um, and the final reason is that it gives you control over your life. 
You know, a lot of people are very caught up in the day to day and they think about, hey, I have to work at this job because I need this paycheck. And it doesn't uh, uh, having that sort of scarcity mindset. Right. And not knowing if everything's going to be OK takes a mental toll on you and limits some of your ambition. And when you no longer have to worry about where your next paycheck is coming from, it gives you the options to focus on what do I want to do with my life. You know, like what sort of legacy do I want to leave? What do I want to be known for? Do I want to uh, be programming things that help people? Do I want to work in this industry, that industry? It just gives you uh, a way to like connect and just live your best life, I think. And so this is the real reason why you should at least try to do some of these things. So with that, I just want to say thank you for your time. It was super cool being able to talk to all of you. I will be answering questions in the chat room afterwards. I know we're out of time. Um, you can always follow me on Twitter and hit me up as well. You can also go to my personal website. I've written a couple things about finance on there. It's mostly just technical stuff, though. Um, and then I also have a bunch of recommended reading in these slides. If you go to my personal site, these will be posted up there later today. And so you'll be able to check that out. Um, but yeah, I think we're out of time. So thank you. Um, can we answer Debbie's or Brian one question before we go into private session? Yes. OK, so Debbie says pay off your debts before having a six month emergency fund. Is it not better to have that money saved and then pay off debts? Uh, great question. So I personally prefer no, just immediately start paying the debts off. The reason why is because having money in savings is being devalued all the time due to inflation. And so for me personally, especially if you're working as an engineer where you're generally making a higher salary, it makes a lot more sense to literally go crazy with it and just try to clear your debt as fast as humanly possible because it's going to save you a ton of money. It's also honestly a little bit of a mental thing because if you're paying down your debt really fast and you know you don't have any emergency fund, you bet your ass is going to motivate you to pay things off quicker because you're going to be like, shit, like what if my car breaks down? I'm not going to have money. And so it puts you in a position where you like have to be successful to do it. Now, obviously, you can do it the other way around if you want. You can have a little bit of an emergency fund and do more later, but it's really a personal choice. So thank you, Randall, very much. Um, I really enjoyed. I, I realize that I need to save a little bit more. Um, and um, again, warm greetings to California. <laughs> thank you. And thanks again for having me. This is super fun. Okay. I will be in the chat. So talk to all of you there. Peace. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.